has a profusion of flies. A lot of them are mosquitoes, but they're not all mosquitoes. So, and the initial food of the young geese and the young ducks is, are actually insects. They start feeding on the flies. And then once they start feeding on the vegetable material, there's a great flush of flowers and grasses and so on in the Arctic in the Arctic summer. But of course, again, they can't stay there for the winter, and so they come here for the winter. And actually, we have more bird species in the UK in winter time than we have in the summer, so we actually gain more than we lose. Anyway, those are some of the reasons why animals migrate. I would also like to kind of explain a few things about migration, which helps us to understand how they can do it. I mean, one of the first things is that many of our summer birds, the birds that are here in summer, go south into Africa, don't they? And they're faced now with crossing the Sahara, which is a formidable obstacle to migration. But the, part of the explanation of that is that the Sahara was not always there. 10,000 years ago, or a little more, the Sahara was burning. And probably many of these birds went south initially and spent their time in the verdant area that we now refer to as the Sahara. I tend to be an inventor of collecting things. And one of the things I've brought, which you're welcome to come afterwards and have a look at, but please don't handle it is a tiny Stone Age flint arrowhead. Now I'm showing it to you because it came from the Sahara. And the Sahara has hundreds of these little flint arrowheads. And that's a kind of indication of what I'm saying. The Sahara, 10,000 years ago, was a verdant place. And so there were elephants and rhinoceros and lions and quite a, lot of, quite a few hominids there. Uh, so it wasn't always as it is now. So as you can guess, birds, often the ones going south, started off with much shorter migrations than they are now landed up with. So a few thousand years ago, it was a lot easier. And now, as the Sahara is increasing in size every year, their migration is extended. But there's something else. If we and I had set out to do it, we'd be worried about provisioning. How would we carry all the food and water and so on. Well, the first answer is that there are a few oases on the way, and birds gradually learn where these are. <coughs> the main explanation is a curious one, and that is, unlike ourselves, birds lose and gain weight very rapidly, so they, they often, they can double or treble their weight uh, by feeding up in a couple of weeks, they put on a lot of body fat, and then they set off on a long journey and do a lot of flying for maybe a <coughs> week, and they expend all that fat, and then they stop down somewhere and again feed for a few days and put on all the fat. So they have this transient fat, and really that explains a lot of their abilities to migrate. The next question I'd, I'd like to come on to is how have we learned about migration? The fact is, it's not a recent. Uh, you probably remember from having read Gilbert White's Natural History of Selborne, people were then thinking that maybe the swallows spent the winter in the bottom of the pond in the mud, or else they thought they spent the winter in crevices in, in rocks or trees or something. All they knew was that they had disappeared. So much of our understanding of animal migration is comparatively recent. And of course, we're still learning, and so there's a lot more to learn about it. Uh, so it's a comparatively new science. So how have we found out? The first big breakthrough, I think, came uh, in the war time when people used radar uh, in order to track airplanes. And the guys looking at their radar screens began reporting a very strange phenomenon that was taking place at night, where they said there were great, great clouds appearing on their radar screens. And initially, they had no idea what they were. And eventually, they realized that they were flocks of migrating birds, because many birds migrate at night. 
And so the blips on the radar screens opened people's eyes to one of the things that was going on. And a lot of our migration still goes on at night, uh, although not all of it. So that was the start. But then, you know, there's been a craze with birdie people uh, for putting numbered rings on birds' legs. Uh, and they want to do it for, for thousands of birds and then release the birds in the hope that eventually when the bird dies or it's caught or it's shot or something, somebody will notice the rain and send the information back about the location of the bird where it died. And so quite a lot of information has been gained that way. The third reason I've said is, is, is much more recent, and that is you can put so-called geolocators on birds, but snag it them was that you've got to find the bird afterwards in order to access the information. And then lastly, there were initially bulky transmitters put on birds back, but now transmitters are getting ever smaller, and so the information that we get is increasing. Let me start off with a, with a remarkable story which began some of the wonder of the bird migration. There was a guy called Lockley, Robert Lockley, Robert, yeah, I think you call him, uh, who worked on an island called Stockholm off the Welsh coast. And Stockholm has thousands of nesting shearwaters. And these are shearwaters here. Uh, the ones on Stockholm are called Manx shearwaters, and they nest in burrows. And they only come in at night to avoid previous predation. So if you're going to see them, you have to go to Stockholm and wait until it's getting dark. And then they all join in their thousands. Now, Lockley had a, a rather smart idea. He knew that these birds migrated, but he wondered how good their uh, orienteering was. So he took an individual shearwater out of his bubble. It was uh, a female, I think, that hadn't laid eggs as yet. So he took out the bird, and it was ringed. So he took a note of the number of its rings. And then they transported it to Boston in America. Now, the issue was they already believed uh, spend the winter in the water off South America. So they knew that these shearwaters never appeared in Boston. But they released it in Boston to see what would happen. And 12 and a half days later, that shearwater was back in his bottle in Scotland. <laughs> so it's like a swing. How the hell can it do it? If you and I were placed in some unknown part of the world and trying to navigate back, it would be really a crippling exercise. So not only can animals navigate to places they know of, but they can really refine their way. And we're all, if you think about it, there are these stories out there about dogs and cats finding their way home. And there was a recent one about a dog in the States that over a period of some months found its way, I think, over a thousand miles back to the farm on which it had been reared. So, migration is full of these amazing stories. So, that's, that's a sheer water story. And I think I won't bother you with that one. One of the other daunting things about birds is that if you feel like this, the uh, species of sheer water which nests uh, in, on the south, around Tasmania and southern Australia. But you'll notice that it actually goes one way north, and then when it's returning south, it takes a different route. So their travels are, are by no means as simple as they could be. Uh, so they don't necessarily come back the same way as they went. And that's gradually turning out to be true of many migrating species. The, this is a fairly recent picture of nightingale migration, and the nightingales had uh, little geolocators put in their backs, and you can see that they were traced uh, down to uh, southwest Africa, and most of them uh, go to the same place in Africa, and curiously sure enough, they behave in much the same way in Africa. As, sorry, as, as they do here, that is, they find a location with mixed woodland and they're on the edges of the woodland. They even do a little bit of singing uh, 
before they find their way back. And so we're gradually learning about Nightingale migration. But I should say something else about the Nightingale. People used to keep Nightingales in cages uh, over a few hundred periods, a few hundred years. And people who kept Nightingales made a curious observation that in the autumn, they tended to battle themselves against the side of the cage, but it was only one side of the cage. And they gradually realized it was the side of the cage facing south. And then in the springtime, these caged nightingales would battle themselves against the other side of the cage. So there's, of course, they didn't tumble to it for a long time, but this represented primal urge within the nervous system of the bird to go south or to go north. And apparently even in places like Slimbridge, where there are large collections of waterfowl, which are pinions, so they cannot fly, but you find that when the time of their migration comes, they actually go to the other side of the pond, as it were, uh, in order to fulfill this primal urge that they have to travel in that direction. I'll leave the line just for a moment because the, the story about, uh, about birds in cages was eventually made a little more scientific uh, in the following way, that people would, would put the bird in a funnel and they coated the funnel all the way around with carbon. And they put the bird in here. And they leave it overnight. And then they would take the trace, they would end up with a trace of paper which had been in the funnel. And sure enough, they found the carbon was all rubbed off in one particular place. And so the knowledge about the direction and the, the momentum to migrate in a big direction. Much of it came from ex early experiments like this, and you found that the bird had an instinctive desire to move in a particular direction. I won't give you the word for it because it's German and I don't know how to pronounce it. But there is a word to explain this or to, to emphasize this primal urge that a migrating creature has to move in a particular direction. Let me now switch from thinking about Nightingale to, to, to another amazing story about migration. What are you looking at is a bird called the bar headed goose, which is occasionally present in waterfowl collections in this country, so you might have seen them, but they, not, they, they normally only occur in India northwards. And you can see on the lower map that they are confined to Nigeria. What's special about the bar-headed goose and another species called the Denzel crane is that their migration takes them over the top of Everest. They fly through the Himalayas every year to access little mountain lakes on the far side of the Himalayas where they nest. And it's obviously a safe place to nest and it's almost the equivalent to the Arctic. And then they fly back over the Himalayas in the autumn because they all winter in India. And the Denzel Crane does something the same. So it, it simply is staggering, isn't it, what birds are able, have been able to accomplish by way of migration. Of course, often you're left scratching your head saying, how did they know the place was there? Some years ago, uh, because I'm a scientist, I've tended to go to conferences in exotic places. And often what I did was that I would arrange to stay on for a week afterwards at my own expense and travel around with it. And some years ago, I was in Hawaii. And I found that I was there in wintertime, and there were a lot of birds that I couldn't easily identify, but they were walking around in people's front gardens and on golf courses and so on. And eventually, the penny dropped that these were American golden plovers. They were remarkably tame, and there was a lot of them. And the American golden plover is quite a common wading bird in North America. 
But of course the question is, how did they ever find Hawaii? How did they know that Hawaii existed? If you look at the map of the world, Hawaii is a dot in the ocean, isn't it? So this other unanswered question arises often about how some of these animals find the places in which they then set up a migrating pathway. Uh, that's just an image to show you, I can switch on the back of the duck, it's of no great significance. There's been a, quite a lot of work in recent years on cuckoo migration. Now the cuckoo, when you think about it, it's a bit like a swift. The young cuckoo never knows its parents, and so once it leaves its foster parents, it's on its own. And yet, these young birds eventually find their way to the Congo, because that's where cuckoos go in the winter, they don't all go to the same place, as you can see on this map, the area around the Congo, it, the individual cuckoos go to quite different places. So it's not all one location, but it's roughly in the same part of Central Africa. So the young cuckoo finds its way there and then comes back to the vicinity in which it was born. in the morning, 
but there's a big beach in Sahara. And I wandered down at about 7 in the morning onto the beach. And the beach was littered with dead birds, absolutely hundreds and hundreds of dead birds. And I persuaded, I rushed back to persuade a lot of the students to help me to collect them. And we picked up, I think, 450 or something out of a much larger number, and washed them and identified them. And uh, eventually, a couple of us had a little paper on it. But this would have been called a bird wreck. And it simply demonstrated to me in this graphic way how dangerous migration would be, because these small birds have been on the way north. But the rain had simply beaten them down into the sea, and they drowned, and then made them wash ashore. And it, there was a great range of birds there, and there were <coughs> hoopoos and night jars and little owls and civil and things. The commonest birds were garden warblers. Uh, I think we picked up 150 garden warblers. Two or three of them, interestingly, had rings on their legs, so we found out that they were actually English birds on their way back to England. But it just demonstrated rather emotionally to me how dangerous the life of a migrating bird can be. There's an American bird, which many US people get rather emotional about, called the ruby throated hummingbird. Now in South America, there are hundreds of species of hummingbirds, but there's only one hummingbird which occurs in North America, in the north of North America and Canada, and that's the ruby throat. <coughs> and this bird weighs, what do you think, I think it's a tenth of an ounce in weight, so it's a tiny bird, and of course it feeds mainly on sugar water. And I'm sure you all know that hummingbirds essentially have got to keep feeding all the time in order to be able to have enough energy to fly because they meet their wings so quickly. Well, the ruby throated hummingbird not only migrates south through the states, if, if it's say Canada that it's uh, arrived out in summer to breed, but they cross the Gulf of Mexico. And they have to do that in one long haul. A lot of the people who live in Florida and so on now feed the hummingbirds because the, before the birds set off, they're very, very keen to store body fat for this huge pilgrimage to get them over the Gulf of Mexico. But it's just amazing to find these tiny mites setting off on this daunting journey in order to make it on the moon. If you watch Spring Watch, you would have found that there was a visit to the Farne Islands by the Welsh guy, whose name I've forgotten for the moment, and he was looking at Arctic terns, which breed. The most Arctic terns breed, of course, in the Arctic, but a few of them breed in this country, and some of them breed on the Farne Islands. But they overwinter uh, in the Antarctic. And the Arctic terror arguably makes the biggest flight pilgrimage of any bird because it moves between the Arctic and the Antarctic twice a year. So it summers in the Arctic and it winters in the Antarctic. And they found one on the Far Islands, which I think established some distance record. So it was a bit like watching the Olympics in Rio in terms of an Arctic terror. There's a particular story I wanted to share with you about whooping cranes. Whooping cranes are American birds, and they're, they're almost extinct. I think the numbers were down to half a dozen. And they normally migrate from the southern states up into northern Canada, and they nest in northern Canada. They set up a breeding program for whooping cranes, and the question was, how could they train the youngsters to migrate? How could they show them where they ought to go? Because unlike the swifts and the cuckoos, cranes, young cranes, normally migrate with their adults, so they learn from the adult. So this is how they did it. That they imprinted the birds to follow uh, a little uh, monoplane. Bigger, yes. uh, and so, uh, now that's partly because cranes share a curious behavioural trait. 
with some other guards. And that is, I mean, you share this, this with peace, for example, that when the queen chick first comes out of the air, it is imprinted on the first object it sees, and it believes that's its mother. And normally, the first object it sees is its mother. But if you're rearing them in captivity, you can arrange that you're there when the chick emerges. And all these fabulous photographs that you see of migrating geese and swans and cranes have all been used, have all been done using this trick. So you imprint the birds so they will follow you anywhere. And that's what these whooping cranes are doing. So they're following the guy in my life because they still believe that's their mother. Um, so it's a lot of bizarre story. Some of you probably have black caps in your garden, but there's a curious story about black caps. And that is, uh, you'll hear them singing in, uh, I suppose, mid April, early May, and they come here from southern Spain or North Africa. They're not a long distance either. But you may also have black caps in your garden in the middle of winter, and they may come to your bird tables and eat fat, or they sometimes eat berries and so on. But it turns out there are two quite distinct populations. So the ones we have in summertime go back to southern Spain or Morocco for the winter. And then the ones that come to us in winter actually breed in Germany. And they have come laterally, and they find Britain as a much better place than central Germany to spend the winter. So they're not the same guards at all. Now, you must have got tired of birds. I'll just say a few things about some other animals before I finish. So, if you've ever walked Attenborough, you must have seen dramatic film of the canoes, the wildebeest, uh, making their pilgrimages and struggling to cross rivers despite the crocodiles. The, the pilgrimage of a wildebeest uh, it's, it's often over a thousand miles, and it's a pilgrimage in pursuit of the new grass. Uh, of course, they do it as a hair, so there's no longer the problem of an individual finding its way. But what it requires is that they walk almost constantly. So the life of the wilderness is not a gentle one, it's a life spent on the hoof. But one of the longest mammalian migrations is that of the North American caribou. They're really reindeer. It's, it's a subspecies of our uh, reindeer, the one we have in Latin. But anyway, they call them caribou. And these animals uh, spend the winter in kind of North America, Southern Canada. But they go to car in the extreme north of Alaska. Uh, and again, it's apparently because the, there's good feeding there and there's lack of predation, so there aren't very many wolves or bears in the extreme of Alaska. And so they make this huge annual pilgrimage. The herd all goes together, so you've got three or four thousand cattle all moving together uh, and finding their way. Of course, there's a great problem in being in the Arctic in the summer, which I mentioned in relation to birds, and that is the bottom of the sea. And the poor old caribou uh, get pretty badly hidden in the summer of mosquitoes. If you spend time on the, on the eastern seaboard of the States, uh, never mind, I mean, on the western seaboard of the States, then you may have gone to look at the migration of grey whales. Grey whales are kind of moderately sized whales. And they make a, a migration every year from the southern states uh, up into Alaska. The north going migration is undertaken with their calves. So the females are not on their own, they have a calf with them. It's quite a dramatic story because they calve in the south, but the females cannot feed. There is no food for the female whales in the south. So they, they come up and then they undertake this mammoth journey right on the coast of the States. And the, the females can only start feeding once they get into the Arctic waters because they feed substantially on the crew, which are small crustaceans. Uh, 
so again, the great whale has this amazing exchange between what is good for the youngster, which is being in the south where the water is warm, and what is good for the adult, which is being in the north where there's plenty of food. And they shuffle twice a year between the two. Now, we're going to jump for a moment to insects. Insects also migrate. And, I mean, you may be surprised to know that many of the large cabbage whites we have in our garden come here from Europe. They, they, many, although some of them have here, many of the large garden whites actually migrate. But the most dramatic butterfly migration is of the monarch butterflies in the States because they hibernate together. They have bigger trees in the southern states and in parts of Mexico. And they all fly there and hang together from the trees. You might think it's a rather dangerous thing to do, given the fact that they might be predicted. But milkweed butterflies, as they're also called, they feed on milkweed and they get a toxin in milkweed, which means that they're noxious, so they're not eaten by birds, so that they can afford to be hanging in these huge numbers of trees without predation. I want to talk about two British examples. There's a day flying moth called the Silver Y. And it flies during the day. And if you're at all observant in your garden, you will have seen Silver Y moths feeding on lavender bushes in the summertime. Well, the Silver Ys all come here from southern Europe. They're migrants. So, back to our gardens uh, uh, each year. This is a butterfly which many of you are familiar with, the painted lady. And only in the last two years has it become clear what painted ladies are up to. Everyone knows that they migrate here from Africa. It was assumed that, that they, they died here. They, they go through a, a short summer breeding cycle, but then none of them over winter. But it now turns out, because people have found them from aircraft and so on, that actually they do return, but they return at an altitude where you can't see them. So it turns out that there is a reverse migration uh, of painted ladies. Now let me come on, I think I'll skip these, and just talk a little bit about navigation. Because <coughs> it's all very well to talk about all this migration, but how do they do it? Well, we only partially know. <coughs> Many animals are sensitive to the position of the sun and the stars. And so they use both a stellar compass and a, and a sun compass. If you think about it, however, it requires a certain amount of mathematics. It isn't that you just knowing where the sun is, you've got to know what time of the day it is in order to determine where north and south are. But they, they use both of them. They use, or many migrating animals, especially birds, use both the stars and the sun. And of course, birds that migrate at night are very dependent on an understanding of the sun. So it means that they are born instinctively with a perception of this, the, the star systems, and they can recognize from the star systems where north and south are. But they have a further uh, capacity. And that is, it turns out that many animals are sensitive to the magnetic field of the Earth. And this has only been recently discovered. It was originally discovered in Norway. <coughs> and the people who went there worked on robins, because the robins are migratory from down Norway. And they found that these robins, migrating at night, knew where north and south were. And it turns out that they have a substance called cryptochrome in their eye. And using this substance, they're able to detect the magnetic field of the Earth. I won't try and explain it to you because it actually involves uh, quantum physics. So the action of the cryptochrome is a very complex uh, topic. I've got a copy of the, one of the original papers if anyone's interested. But it's really quite sophisticated physics in order to understand it. 
but it does mean that navigation is also an amazing uh, phenomenon as well as migration. And there you have it. Thank you for your attention. Do we know? What was the, where, where, when, when, when they migrate? Oh, yeah, I mean, 
and your brain you know, it swallows are uh, dramatic either because they all they go to South Africa. Um, and I think it takes them about a month, at least a month, to get there or to come back. So they do it in stages. Uh, and they, they seem I don't know whether they instinctively know of stop off places or whether they just gradually learn. Um, but yeah they, is a long journey. And then they, uh, what was the What is the eel? What is the eel? The eel is a very mysterious animal. It is reputed that they all breed in the Sargassa Sea, in the quiet zone of the Atlantic, and that they have to go there in order to breed. And what happens is that the eel birds, which are born there, are only about this way, migrate to much of Europe and then have this inclination to ascend rivers. They can also even crawl on the land provided it's degrading and it's wet. And so they have an urge to go north. And then they spend anything up to 10 years growing in ponds and rivers before they make a return migration, usually in the, in the night time in September. I mean, you may know the river keepers on rivers like the Test and the Itch used to be given permission to track the eels going south. And actually they made a lot of money out of them at the time because they were very popular in France. And they, they would track the eels on dark nights in September and October when they were all coming down. What is uncertain, I believe, is whether the British eels ever get back to the Sargassum. There is a story that they may never make it. And at the moment there's a program going on where they marked a number of eels in Ireland, and they are trying to track them to and from. And I, I think they're still waiting to find out. Hello, Katie. And did you did you have a question as well, Katie? No, uh, Simon, you got it. Okay. And you mentioned earlier on that there's a trade-off. There's an advantage to these very long journeys because they, they can feed or, or raise their young in different areas. But I, I wondered if you had any idea about what the, um, what the loss rate was on these journeys for different species. Uh, uh, and I had a particular reason for asking because uh, John and here and, and myself have got a friend who, um, who's very active in, the, um, in an organization called BirdLife Malta. And, um, and he goes over to Malta to try to disrupt the, yeah, the shooting of the, of the migrating birds, because everybody, uh, a lot of the species funnel through Malta as a stopping off point in the, in the Mediterranean. And obviously he, he thinks it's a cruel activity, but also it's cutting down the success rate of the, sure. of the species, yeah. the, the quite rare species sometimes that are passing through there. So, is it is it a small percentage that get there and back? I think it varies a lot from species to species. I gather that for some birds, about a third of the numbers never make it, uh, so they die of migration. And of course, I'm sure you know, but maybe everyone else doesn't know that migration to Africa for small songbirds is no longer as advantageous as it used to be, because many of these birds. There's a pass through an area called the Sahel, that is just south of Zamara. The Sahel used to be very verdant and there's quite a lot of water and it was fairly thinly populated. But in recent years, it's been intensively cultivated and people have been using lots of pesticides and so on. And it turns out that many of our migrating birds perish in the Sahel now, whereas they used to go there as a swamp over. So it's, yeah, it has. Pluses and minuses, I think, for each species. But I guess that uh, a rough number might be that a third of them are not made. Thank you. Thank you, very interesting. Um, set my brain going as a humanist as to how some of these patterns, or all of these patterns, have evolved. I presume there are not salmon swimming around in the Atlantic thinking. Ah, now if I go up this river, then that would be safer for my babies. Uh, yeah, it doesn't work like that, does it? So, has it just been random that ones that went up rivers were more likely to have uh, progeny that survived? 
And in that case, if that's how these migratory patterns have evolved, how is it passed from one generation to another? Is it only because the uh, babies follow the adults, but actually that's not true? I mean, the salmon are, you know, they haven't got any parents by the time they go back up river. Uh, so, how is it? How did it evolve, and how does it get passed from generation to generation? Well, what do we not know yet? I, I think you, from what you say, I think mean, you understand as much as I do. About <laughs> And she said, that might frighten me. 
And to the best of my knowledge, she had never learned anything about snakes, she had never seen a snake, so I think that our fear of spiders and snakes is probably a hangover from our days in the caves, when it paid off to be afraid of these animals because they were venomous. But there must be many more examples of that, of behavior which is a hangover from the days when we lived a much more natural life along with the rest of nature. Can you think of others? Um, well, certainly in the biophilia um, way, that would be bio. Oh, in, in the biophilia um, approach, that would be biophobia, is the biophobia. Yes. Um, but um, at, at this minute, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, in terms of our attachment to the natural world, it sadly is receding because people are increasingly urbanized, aren't they? I mean, the growth of mega cities in the world it is dramatic, and increasingly people live in towns and hardly know that uh, temples turn into frogs or don't come from a car or whatever. So that there is something going on in our human population which is a, a distancing from the natural world, which I think is a little bit sad, but it seems to be going on. Norman, is there any link between um, migration, problems with migration, and the loss of numbers in, in bird species? Well, that, the problem is, I suppose there is. I mean, many of our songbirds are not doing well. And that's the, I mean, that question drives a lot of this research on cuckoos and nightingales and so on, to try and find out whether they're dying in Africa, whether they're dying in the UK, or are they dying on route? Mm. And uh, my impression is that the Sahel area has a lot to answer for. Many of them now seem to die in the Sahel. Uh, I think that it varies a lot from species to species. Just a supplementary question. It, on, on the uh, question that was raised earlier about learning and how, how they learn in the first place. Yeah. Uh, following on from that, you said, as conditions change, as you, you mentioned, you know, conditions are, are, are changing to the detriment of yeah. many of these species. Is there any evidence that they modify their behaviour in terms of what yeah, they're doing? There is. There's quite a lot of evidence uh, that, that, that especially birds, are constantly changing. And so uh, a bird like the chip uh, increasingly over winters in the UK while they're going to the trouble of migrating. And I think that's thought to be mainly climate change and our winters are now providing more food for chip chats than they used to. And so a lot of a lot of migrating birds are slightly changing their routes or their stopover points in relation to where it's good to be or where it's not good to be. So that suggests that suggests that the species somehow has, a, has the ability to relearn in a comparatively yeah, short time. It? I agree. I, I think that's, that's a very good picture. That's a very good point. I think it's very good picture. So they seem to be very open-minded about a lot of the things they do, and they're prepared to take on. I mean, if you just think years ago, how quickly blue tits learned to open bottle tops and drink the milk. And they've been doing it, I think, in the South of England. But before any of them knew it, it spread to the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they do learn very quickly, don't they? And then, of course, we had the bottle manufacturers have to change the tops and work with the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You talked about the fluctuating numbers and the way that they sort of get defeated. But isn't that the same through all species? I mean, we find, like this year, I've seen two wasps the whole year. Last yes. year, we were inundated with them, yeah. but we don't, never seem to be able to pinpoint exactly what causes that fluctuation. Yeah, of course, you're absolutely right. It affects many of our sedentary species as well. I think the wasps are beginning to appear now, but nonetheless, it's been a very poor wasp year. Yeah. Uh, and I think wasps have been declining for some years. It does appear that many of us have been using insecticides in our gardens and that many of these insecticides have much longer half-lives than was assumed. 
And so our gardens continue to harbour insecticides uh, and that affects the insect populations. Um, Sorry, can I just go back to the chiff chats oh, yeah. that you say are uh, a lot now not bothering to migrate because they're because of climate change and so there's enough food here through the winter. Yeah. So is the chiff chaff just going on eating here and there's food, why do anything else? Uh, or has it learnt from parents there is no need to go anywhere else? Yeah, well I don't know. <laughs> uh, is that a real question? I, I think it's a very good question, but I think yeah. I, I, I don't have no the answer to it. And, uh, whether the learning is associated with watching your parents, whether the young chip chap learns from his parents what to feed on and where to go to find food. Uh, because it, it must be very difficult for an animal to adapt its behaviour, must it? It's much easier to have a routine which you stick to. And yet many of them seem to be able to make minor adaptations, which are really quite surprising. Yeah, uh, I mean, the reason I ask is because I actually quite often get annoyed by uh, commentaries on programmes on television or something by terminology that assumes animals and birds are doing things in order to do something yeah. with a sort of conscious purpose yeah. and I don't think we actually believe that animals and, and, and birds have conscious well, purposes. Uh, one, of our, one of our constant human this is to underestimate the intelligence of the other animals with which we share the planet. And so almost all of our behaviour used to be thought to be entirely instinctive. But it's becoming clear that although the bedrock is probably instinctive, that they can modify it by rationalisation to quite a considerable extent. Um, so you're right. So. I was thinking that, um, from the point of view of the chip chat, it, um, it presumably what's important is what, what triggers them to migrate in the first place, I mean to migrate at a particular time. Yes. And if it was, say, a um, temperature signal, uh, when it got to a certain low temperature it was time for them yeah. to go, um, if, if because of global warming they're not reaching that low temperature, then they um, might well stay on, it might be as simple as that, or some of them would and they successfully um, survive the winter and breathe the next year. And um, so, you know, maybe the ones, maybe there's a slight variation, say, in the, uh, what temperature signal um, sets them off. from yeah. the ones that um, have a slightly lower signal, when it gets a bit warmer, they stay on. Yeah, I, I think you're right. But in the main, uh, the crucial signals seem to be daylight. So most migrating species use daylight as an indicator of when they should go and when they should come back. Uh, but clearly that is modified by uh, things like temperature. And of course in, in many migrating birds it's modified by the wind. And you'll find that sometimes you have a huge build-up of particular species waiting to migrate because the winds are adverse. And they may spend two weeks waiting on the wind before they actually set off. Norman, are you optimistic or pessimistic about uh, birds and butterflies in the next, I don't know, mm. few decades? <laughs> I, I'm, thanks my nature, I think, slightly optimistic. Uh, I think it's a bit of a balance. Uh, it's not getting better, and uh, our butterfly species are diminishing quite rapidly. Uh, whether we are learning quickly enough, to make an adaptation. I mean, I think coming out of the, it, it's almost a crucial time that Brexit offers us an occasion to modify some of our agriculture, and I think that will be fundamental to what happens to a lot of our wildlife. What, what modify in, in a good way? Well, the trouble with British agriculture is that it's been very much geared to making money and providing the maximum amount of food without very much concern about what is good for the wildlife. Now if you compare that with what's happened in France, where actually the agriculture is often rather primitive, but I don't think people did it 
out of good intention, but because it's much less highly developed, it is, it's, the French agriculture has been, has been much better for nature conservation. Now what's going on at the moment is that farmers be, are being paid a premium to have hedgerows and to have areas of fields adjacent to hedgerows which they'll seed with wildflowers and so on, and to have areas in the middle of fields where skyrocks can nest. So there are many hopeful things going on, but it, it, I think it's, it's not yet evident how the economics are going to work out. Brexit is an opportunity, but whether it will solve it, I don't know. Okay. Um, Any more? I, I want to, as I stand in March, and um, people are always surprised at the number of egrets that we have there, and if the egrets stay, but the herons also remain as well, and as the ground begins to be head as a heron. Yeah. So maybe they're learning from each other. Yes, I mean, you put your finger on, I mean, both the grey heron and the little egret are on a, on a roll, aren't they? Their numbers are increasing dramatically. Uh, and they seem to be doing very well. So it, it's not, not everything is diminishing. Uh, some species seem to be doing very well. Any more? Or are we there? Okay, well, um, Norman, we're going to present it with uh, a bottle of wine, if that's acceptable. <laughs> with our, our, um, our aim to promote science and understanding of science and the natural world. So thank you very much indeed, Norman. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I think you're a wonderful audience and it's just great really fun to be here. So. <laughs> <laughs>